Hi, Chido. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. I'm glad you came through and decided to share with us. Yeah, I'm so excited about this. As you should be, as I am as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are working on Rambo Academy, which is a language learning platform. Is that yeah. like a fair thing to say? Correct. Yeah, let's talk about that a bit more. Like, what problem are you trying to solve with Rambo Academy? Yeah, you know... Um, let me maybe tell you how we started. Yeah, that's uh, right. We started when um, I was on my gap year after university looking for something to do. Yeah. And um, I live in a community where there are other Zimbabwean families around. I'm based in Johannesburg. Yeah. And I just started deciding to teach Chishona to like the children who are around. So taught one little boy Chishona. He could now speak a little better. The yeah. other moms are like, ah! no i want my kids to speak <laughs> yeah. um got a couple more students and and before we knew it we now had isindebele as well on the uh, well in our in our in our portfolio yeah. so i think you know it kind of started as me just looking for extra money but really the problem that we're trying to solve one of the problems we're trying to solve is that of lost identity in the diaspora community and even just in a lot of young people that are growing up with english and other western languages being the main language of yeah. communication um, so we're trying to obviously solve that problem as well as to create more resources for indigenous languages yeah that's dope so it sounds like when you started off it was literally you going to these places to teach yeah but now it's actually like a platform right so why did you decide to like transition to tech uh, COVID, <laughs> that, that, that happened. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we were going to people's houses, teaching them. And when it started, obviously no one could move around, um, but our students still wanted to learn. So we started making some resources for them, but it wasn't scalable, it wasn't sustainable. And um, that's kind of when someone was like, oh, why don't you look into making a website? So it was just yeah. a website at the beginning, really a website where people could now book sessions and then we could have Zoom like meetings which mimicked the physical ones but as we yeah. looked more into technology because my co-founder and i are both non-tech founders yeah as we looked more into technology we saw that no okay we can have that side of the business which mimics a teaching lesson online yeah. but we can also create a platform where people can come and learn anytime so if you're like in new york for example and there's time zone difference you yeah. don't have to wait for me to wake up to teach you you can just already start learning on your own yeah that sounds yeah, that actually makes a lot of sense. So you move to a platform where you now have like maybe pre-recorded lessons. And um, let's talk about just before that, because there's a yeah. tweet of yours I saw <laughs> where you detailed a lot of challenges um, that you faced uh, in building this platform. It was, mm. I think, a 25-month delay, lawyer challenges, uh, getting to understand the tech and stuff like that. Yeah. What was going on in that period? <laughs> <laughs> it was stressful I mean it's still stressful now right but I think when you okay so both of us are not linguists so on yeah. the language side there were challenges tech side there were challenges um, even just dealing with people there were challenges as you yeah. mentioned we had some legal issues and um, it can get really overwhelming you know and again it, it's, it's a place where you have to decide am I going like do I believe in this enough to keep moving forward and building yeah. it or am I just going to be like, <laughs> I'm good, <laughs> I'm good. So, so yeah, I think, I think one of our major challenges was the tech. Um, everything else, we took time to study and learn and consult, but the tech was, was a bit difficult to grasp. There's so many different ways of building a tech platform or even yeah. just a website, right? A simple website, there's so many different ways. Um, and as someone who doesn't know, you also don't know how to assess the competence levels of the person who's developing for you. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, you can, someone can just come and close you before your like, eyes. Yeah, this is like yeah, I can the do this. best thing. Don't worry, <laughs> I'll develop it for you. You pay your money thinking this is going to come out and, and then, nothing, nothing well, pans yeah, out. That, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it was really <laughs> challenging. But I think for anyone who's kind of looking to build a tech platform, um, those are potential challenges you can face. But yeah. again, there's solutions for them. We've come out of it and you can too. Fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. And so one of the things you mentioned there is... Um, having a co-founder. Mm. Um, what's the thinking behind that and what have been like maybe the upsides and downsides of that experience of working with someone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think co-founder dynamics are very sensitive yeah. because you're literally committing to build your baby with this person <laughs> yeah. for a long period of time, right? So it's it's 
I think people need to be more careful when they choose their co-founders. Take your time. Yeah. Um, and also be humble, right? You also aren't perfect. Yeah. So you can't do everything on your own. Um, for, for me, I needed someone who had a skill set that was different to my own. So my co-founder has a different skill set which contributes to the business. Yeah. And um, I think also just, just building with someone else reduces the risk, right? So if I was building alone, when I'm sick, when I'm traveling, nothing is nothing moving, is moving. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but now when the co-founders, at least you're mitigating that risk a bit. Yeah. And I think even just as a norm feedback in the startup well. community, feedback, yeah, definitely feedback. You know, you, you're not, it's not just your ideas and your thoughts. You have someone else challenging that. But I mean, also just as a norm in the startup community, yeah. Um, Investors don't usually like investing in solo founders, again, because of the risk around that. So just also being aware of things like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, the way I chose my co-founder, trying to plug a skills gap, I mostly didn't plug all of them, but it plugged a key one for our type of business. Yeah. And someone that I also respected and, and could see the value that they would be adding to the business. Yeah, that's brilliant. So let's talk about since launch, because we talked about the challenges that you faced prior to the launch right mm. um now you've launched the platform <laughs> the challenges don't stop there <laughs> launching is like a success but yeah. now the real work <laughs> yeah, kind of begins, begins isn't it definitely what are some of maybe the challenges and things that you've actually learned as as you since you launched and when did you launch yes so we officially launched uh, august 2021 so just yes. over a year ago yeah and I think the first challenge that a lot of, like actually every entrepreneur faces when they launch is actually truly understanding what keeps your business running, right? Yeah. So you would think that, okay, if I just make money, then cool, you know, my business is going to keep moving. <laughs> but that's not the case for everyone. Some people always need to have customers. Some people always need to have feedback or to just be visible in certain spaces because that's where, like, again, their money then comes from. Um, and also, I think one of the th key things, especially for us, was understanding how long it takes a customer to make a decision and then to pay. And those are two different things. So I can yeah, maybe market explain to that to me. Yeah, so I can market to you and be like, oh, come and learn Isi Zulu, right? Yeah. And you're like, I need to learn this language. Yeah. Um, in a space with the Zulu speakers, I need to speak to them. But you're not going to make that decision right then and then. You're not going to pay you're right then pay and then. It may take maybe two weeks to actually be like, actually, I really need to commit to this thing. After two weeks, you're like, okay, Chiro, tell me more about your courses. How's the curriculum? That's more time, right? Yeah. And for me, I need to understand how long it takes me to secure a paying customer because then those are the types of people I want to also invest in, especially at the early part of my business. Yeah. I shouldn't just be shooting at everyone, hoping someone hoping catches. Something, yeah. If I understand those dynamics, it makes it easier to understand how my business stays alive yeah. then i can do all the other things like have great marketing campaigns get influencers yeah. start uh, working on new features you know all the things that make us enhance the business but first you need to survive yeah. before you can enhance <laughs> <laughs> and so that's like a very that's like a very like uh, vital thing right and it's it's so valuable <laughs> because a lot of people really are shooting in the dark to a degree mm. um so for you guys how then do you get to track that metric where you how do you get to identify that hey man this mm. is like a high potential customer for lack of a better term before you get to convert yeah yeah uh, for us a lot of the things we learned we learned by doing right yeah. we, we weren't seeking this knowledge so like i mentioned we started with students already like yeah. we started teaching and from the feedback that we got from moms and teachers and even just adults who wanted to learn that helped us then start creating a bit of a formula around how our business works so mm. you know you'll get a mom in choir no i want my kids to enroll maybe she she's like, okay i've got three kids but let me put one first so you can't count to say i've got three, three students <laughs> no you only have one because that's the one who paid yeah. she'll put in her first child and then we're like, we need to work and make sure this kid first loves it and wants to come back and is and that's you know, how we speaking. The... Then you get the, <laughs> the next three. Now with the next mom, I know the next mom is not going to put one. She's going to put all three because she's seen a mom who's put her, all her kids through the program. Yeah. So she trusts that, okay, if this mom can put all her kids, I can also put all we my kids, right? Yeah. Then yeah, now we have a model around moms or parents. Do the same thing for young adults. Young adults, okay, budget, you know, if it's not around month end, no one is going to pay. <laughs> so, you know, you start from the 20th to the 30th, you can start that's expecting people to commit and to pay. Again, that's a model for young adults. Yeah. And we keep going until we've got something for each customer yeah, persona. Yeah. And so that's, 
very interesting as well because I, I read somewhere that when you started, you you anticipated that your your market, or at least uh, the students you'd have, would be mostly children, and then it turned out that a lot of like young adults were quite interested in in what you're offering. Most definitely. What's what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, what's going on? Yeah, like why why are they why are they like so interested? What's what's the catch for them? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you have friends that are studying in South Africa? Yeah, 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 yeah. Two, three. You're right. Yeah. Uh, if they get jobs, they're going to want to localize. They're going to want to learn some local languages to just, you know, be able to get into the system. Even if they don't, they want to improve their CVs to become more competitive. Things like language help you to do that. So if your company is expanding, even as a Zimbabwean company is expanding to South Africa, and they've got someone who can speak Setswana, even just introductory Setswana, yeah, that's a huge person. competitive advantage. Yeah. So that's why a lot of young people are looking to learn languages. Again, it's, it's $10 per month to learn languages in Rambo Academy. It's not expensive, right? It's affordable. Yeah. You can learn the basics. Already, you're competitive as a candidate and also just improves your confidence. Yeah. So that's the one side. The other side is, again, a lot of young people just really want to reconnect back to their roots, you know. Um, I, think, I think at this time, in, in, I, I'm not quite sure you know, what the era What's is, going, yeah. but, yeah. but there's a lot of people really mm. wanting to reconnect to Africa, to their roots, to, the, to, to just identity. understand more about yeah. where they come from. So we have people who even come just for like maybe two weeks to just be like, okay, tell me about Mashungo, because I come from Mashungo. Please, can you tell me about Mashungo, the Karanga people? Yeah. What is the difference between Chikaranga, Chimanika? You know, people just want to understand the dynamics around language, culture, heritage. Um, and fortunately, we're able to offer those services too. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I do agree with you because... Um, I speak to a lot of people, I go to like a lot of events, um, there's just like a very positive energy uh, around being African right now. Yeah. Um, I hope we can keep that going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really do. Um, and then, so one of the things that um, comes with starting a company is you need, no matter how like valiant your intentions are mm. at the end of the day you need to make money yeah um so you talked about uh, the subscription model uh the ten dollars per month yeah uh you talked about the uh, one-on-one -on -one sessions mm. maybe let's talk about uh your your business models more just in depth uh, yeah. uh if you have any other and even just the ones you did mention before yeah yeah uh so so our primary business model that we started with um, is a B2C model, so business yeah. to consumer. Yeah. So yeah, that's the subscription model. That's also the pay per listen model for the virtual sessions, um, as well as the translation, um, which is also kind of like B2B, right? Because now we're working with companies as well on the translation side of things. So initially it was just individuals who are like, listen, can you translate my pamphlet or my ebook or something like that? Yeah. And I was actually companies who wanted us to translate their websites or, um, you know, copies of, of things that they share with their clients and beneficiaries. Yeah. Um, so those are the business models that we're working on at the moment. Um, I think with business models, always be open f to them evolving. And um, especially with the way the world is working now, you know, mm. there's so many different things are just changing. And in the different markets we work in, some models work better than others. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think that's something we're, we're very open to like figuring out and improving. But those are the three that we have at the moment. That you're yeah, that sounds that sounds really cool. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the in the translation one, and I'll talk to you about that yeah. off camera when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> but um, another aspect of uh, starting up, and I've seen you uh, involve yourself heavily, uh, for lack of a better term, is you know raising funds, uh, pitching competitions, mm. um, that kind of thing. You've you've participated in a few, like I'm saying. Um, why is that something that's important for you as a founder for Bamboo as a business? Yes. So um, when we were strategizing how to raise capital, yeah. um, obviously many options came, but there were kind of two that stood out. So either raising venture capital yeah. funding or going the ground route. So we decided to go the ground route, which is why we apply to many competitions, are always pitching, always looking for avenues to get grant funding. Yeah. Um, 
the main reason being we were not ready for VC funding, like the requirements. Yeah, uh, we weren't, did. Yeah, we, we weren't, <laughs> they need to see a lot of data, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we weren't really ready, ready for that. Just as a bit, like even our maturity levels, we just weren't ready for that. Yeah. And also we wanted to just learn a little bit more about this, that we're a bit more... You know, we can also negotiate when we get to the table, right? You don't yeah, just take you don't want to get the like star strike. And you're like, oh, yeah, no, you this just want is to <laughs> understand what your business needs, yeah. build it with as much of your own capital and like free money, I guess, as you can, yeah. and then go in knowing exactly to say, okay, I need this amount of money for tech development or go to market strategy and you know, you move Stuff forward like, like that. that. So yeah. that's kind of why we, we apply to a lot of competitions, but. Also, fortunately, they really help us refine our business model because we're talking to people who are literally analyzing your business as you're yeah. speaking. And you know, there's a gap here. No, that's a great thing. Continue going that route, you know. So yeah. it's really helped us a lot to refine, to refine our model. Yeah, that sounds, yeah, it sounds, it sounds really good. And another thing you did mention about um, VC versus grants um, that I'd like to mention is um, the more of your... Um, the more mature your company is, by the time you get to VC, mm. um, the more you can get like better outcomes as a founder. Yeah. Because if people are coming in on day one when it's worth nothing, <laughs> <laughs> or it's worth very little, best believe when it does blow up, they're taking a big chunk, chunk. off because they're mm. rightfully so. They're like really responsible yeah, for. Yeah, they took a risk. Yeah. On you, so. So that's another outcome that uh, founders sometimes tend to ignore mm. or maybe they know it but, but you know, <laughs> people have different um, aims yeah. really and then i was reading recently about um there's this nigerian startup i think it's called Co kobo 360 mm. it's logistics and the founder was talking about um de-emphasizing fundraising and he was just talking about how fund fundraising very quickly can actually like take over your whole schedule right mm. because you're applying to these things you're going interviews um and then there's the rounds where you refine and, and whatnot and yeah. sometimes that can take you away from your work how do you then get to uh balance that right uh mm. paying attention to the baby rambo which is uh, the core focus yeah and then going out and mobilizing these funds mm. yeah yeah it hasn't been easy um it hasn't been easy. I think definitely at the beginning, um, when you start fundraising, it can consume you, right? Because you're yeah. like, I'm so close. Or oh, I just won. Let me try another one. Yeah, um, yeah. So I Especially think, I think, that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we fell into that trap a little bit at the beginning where, you know, well, okay, let's, let's keep going. Um, until again, we realize, okay, some, some elements of the business aren't working as well as they should be. Yeah. Um, and I think you're yeah, just having to have an honest conversation about that and saying, okay, maybe let's not apply for everything. Let's actually do a bit more research around the things we want to apply for and then exert our energy into those things because we know they're either aligned with our vision or, you know, we have a better chance have a better for chance, some reason. Because yeah. it's not every competition you win and we haven't won every competition yeah. as well, you know. Um, so, yeah, that has helped us to map things out. But then also having a bit more of a contingency structure on the business side of things. So the moment something starts falling, you know, we have someone who like rings the alarms like, guys, we haven't had a meeting in how long. This yeah. is not this is being not done. Place. You know, we're okay. No, no, let's stop everything. <laughs> let's go back to the let's business. Let's focus on this. Um, so yeah, it we're now better at it definitely now than we were at the beginning, but it, it was a bit difficult to balance. Yeah. And then, so on a more personal note, right? Um, and more broadly, beyond even uh, Rambo, I take it is it fair to say you've been in South Africa longer than you've been in Zim in it's, like your life? Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, so. But you also come to Zim like quite often. You have like a lot of exposure to uh, Zimbabwe and, yeah. and South Africa. So what do you see in South Africa that you think, damn, I wish this was in Zimbabwe. This mm -hmm. would make uh, my life so much easier. And then maybe what do you see in Zim that you would think, damn, I wish this was in South Africa. It would make mm -hmm. my life so much easier. Yeah. Interesting question. Um, my first startup was actually founded in Zim. Yeah. So so I'm quite <laughs> like you know <laughs> let's do Passionate. this guys let's build the country. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I think what I would take from South Africa and bring to Zim is yeah. is probably the way and ease of doing business. Um, I don't need to like go to a bank branch to just do like basic 
banking services. Yeah. Um, it's easier to contact people. Um, yeah, I think just, just I don't know what the correct word is, but yeah, ease of doing business really yeah. across the financial sector and just, you In know, general. normal peer to peer business interactions. Yeah. Uh, from Zim, what I take to South Africa, I think I'd probably take, I guess, two things. Yeah. <laughs> First, the hunger to succeed like really? you know you know yeah that th that energy is so infectious right yeah i think sometimes and so i don't are great but i think sometimes like there are a lot of options right so if that's my car okay, cool maybe i can get a job or i can maybe oh yeah go work definitely for another startup you know like there's here it's like much more risky isn't yeah it? yeah here do it's like die. do or die <laughs> if this doesn't work i have nothing and a lot of people are like going against family wishes right to yeah. really build out their dream and yeah. just that hunger that infectious energy <laughs> you're like present <laughs> yeah it's complex it's, um, yeah, yeah I, so i hear that so that and kind the of hunger thing? and i think the second thing would probably just be the diversity in solutions um, that you can actually go into. Yeah. There's so many things that need solutions in Zimbabwe. And for someone like me who loves building and, and so starting opportunity. things up. Yeah, opportunity. I think, and, and also just, you know, because um, I think in Zim, if you identify an opportunity and you're like, I'm going to run with this. Yeah. If you run with it for a solid six to ten months, yeah. you'll, pro you'll see yourself doing really great things. Yeah. Corporates <laughs> are now calling you. You know, you, it, I think it's easier to then It's get, easier to start up. Easier to start up and to then get into a bit of like the bigger spaces. Yeah. Um, whereas in South Africa, there's some startups who've been there for like years, but yeah. haven't even really um, yeah. Yeah. managed to, to, to get there. So... Yeah, yeah, I think... But both markets are great. Both both markets are really, really unique. Yeah, I think I really, I think I really um, relate to what you said, the last thing you said there, where it's like, there's a lot of opportunity, but there is a reason why it's there, right? Because yeah, cause it's <laughs> kind of difficult, but <laughs> it's, like, it's there. So yeah. yeah, that's a really interesting thing. And then you touched on something there that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, your first uh, startup, you said your first startup failed. What was that? And maybe if if we're if you're at liberty, let's talk about why that failed because that's mm -hmm. a, that's the thing we we're talking about before we started where like people don't really get to explore the less glamorous sides but, of of entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, I think only recently have my co-founder and I started saying it failed. Like <laughs> <laughs> we hadn't accepted yeah. that you know it failed. Um, I mean, we're pivoting now, but the first idea failed. Yeah. So um, the first startup um, is called Uplan. It's still yeah. alive, active, operating. I mean, with Uplan, people are able to book venues online. So we listed venues all over the country yeah. from conference venues. And this venues, is Zimbabwe, right? Zimbabwe, yeah. yeah. Um, from conference venues, lodges, um, product launch venues, Wedding. weddings, yeah. everything. Um, and then, you know, we were trying to get people to then book those venues online. Um, so that we could try also formalize the whole booking system around hospitality, especially people yeah. who don't have hotels. Because with hotels, it's a bit easier. But anything else, it's like, okay, yeah. how do I know that if I book, I'm not going to find someone else there? Yeah. Or if I pay and I now need to cancel, I'll get my money back. You know, all those, all yeah. those problems. Um, and I think one of the main reasons that, that it failed was it, it was really technical really really technical for for the consumer or what for, for both sides right because yeah. i mean you do get some venue owners who appreciate things like that yeah. others are just i've got a it's space i just need money <laughs> that's all right yeah. so it is really technical and we hadn't invested in the teaching process and i think now going into my second startup i actually already accepted that every single startup i start i have to invest in the teaching process because yeah. I'm the one who understands the vision and what we're trying to do and how it helps you. Yeah. You don't know how languages or learning, you know, can can what, what it can do what for it me. can do for you, yeah. right? So I need to invest in teaching you, and then from then on, understand, like, kind of go then into selling you the product or the service. Yeah. Um, and then also again the the pandemic because I mean it's hospitality. No one was able to move yeah, or book or do anything. Years. So so and I mean two years. I mean businesses can hardly survive six months. One more two years. <laughs> yeah. um, but interestingly enough, you know we because we invested so much in our marketing and everything two years ago, and then we obviously kind of like stopped. We still have people asking us, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's what really inspired us. Then pivot and keep keep building. Yeah. So yeah, catch catch the pivot <laughs> in a couple of. 
weeks hopefully time. round round two round two um, <laughs> works out yeah? yeah hopefully i mean uh, you're wiser now so <laughs> <laughs> you know it can only go up from yeah, here yeah so. <laughs> you try again with the, with a lot more um with a lot more knowledge but yeah that's really basically everything i wanted hey i i'm so glad you you came to to share with us no no thank you thank you so much for having me